Welcome back to Subject to Cross. I'm your co-host, P. Kratz. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm all confused. I'm your co-host, Caroline Donato. And I'm your co-host, Pete Kratz. Does that, does that feel right? It doesn't right? flow as much off to think about it, but I mean... Listen, I, I just want you to be comfortable. I think that the way we could do it is that when you lead, you're the host, I'm the co-host. When I lead, I'm the host, you're the co-host. That's simpler. Okay, if we look at... I, I don't watch morning shows, but I assume... In a morning show, when you have like the three people behind a desk, they're all the hosts of the show. Why don't you just say, and I'm your other host? Because mm, that doesn't or, flow. Or let's, I'm your host, Caroline Donato, and I'm your host, Peter Kratza. No, I like host, co-host. Well, you're just putting yourself in the second. That just seems like a personal issue. <laughs> when I lead, I'm the host. I don't see us ever as like one's leading Well, and then one's I guess not. we're both hosts or co-hosts. You pick. We're both hosts. Okay. Okay, welcome back to Subject to Cross. I already did that. We're going to talk about guns. Cool. We, we talked about Alec Baldwin, so I think this is a nice segue. So this topic comes to mind because it is a very hotly litigated topic right now all over the country, and that is the scope of the Second Amendment. And there was a case that came down. Uh, well, in the Second Amendment, the I mean, do we just assume oh, everybody knows what the Second Amendment is? I was operating that way, but if you yeah. want to describe the Second Amendment, go ahead. Yeah, Guns. The, the right to keep and bear arms. Yeah. And a case came down authored by Supreme Court Justice Thomas, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. That occurred in 2022. There was another episode where Pete was talking about a bunch of cases and the, the world was on fire. But um, I think I, it was the host. Oh my God. And I mentioned that even though our due process rights and all these other constitutional rights are at, at issue, our Second Amendment right is in full force. Was that a bit of foreshadowing? It was foreshadowing okay. for this episode. Okay. I actually find this to be a very interesting topic. And I am litigating it right now in one of those weird quasi-criminal collateral administrative courts. And we're currently in the middle of briefing uh, before this court. But Bruin stands for the fact that... And you have permission from the I have client. permission from the client to talk about this case. I'm not going to divulge any details that would actually indicate to, indicate to anybody who this client is or what this what the name of my case is. But Bruin in 2022 essentially says that before the government, any government, state or federal, can regulate firearms, basically Bruin says there has to be a precedent in history that supports depriving a person or, or that supports the regulation depriving them of their Second Amendment right. So basically you have to find finding era history that says, yes, this person can't have their Second Amendment right. Like if they were a witch? That example wasn't given. <laughs> I think I've disclosed what my what my feelings are about this new federal firearm standard. Sorry. Well, I do think I, I do think in some circumstances the the firearm regulations do go too too far, and in others they don't go far enough. Okay. Okay. And where I'm lucky in this litigation that I'm currently knee deep in is that. It's easy to want to fight for this client. Uh, this client is a responsible client. So Bruin is basically saying if there's any... Bruin was a case where it, it was deciding the legality of a New York state law. And ultimately, the New York state law went too far in, in terms of what a person needed to prove in order to get their firearm license. And Bruin said, no, that law doesn't have any basis in founding era history to support regulating the Second Amendment in this way. I'm trying to give very broad strokes. Well, it also said that you have the right to bear firearms in public, not just that was very important in that decision, right? Not only the right to bear firearms at your home, but you have the right, which the state has to overcome some hurdles. It was kind of like burden shifting, right? It's now the, the it's the government's burden, government's burden. And it's a heavier burden to meet 
to prevent people from carrying in public. Essentially, if the government wants to regulate firearm uses, if the government wants to regulate an individual's Second Amendment right, then they have a high burden to meet. That high burden is that regulation has to be consistent with founding era history. Is that, a, that an easy right. way to sum mm -hmm. it up? So I have I have this case where I'm tying it back to PFAs. My client years ago, and it was around COVID. Um, he was the recipient of a BS, and I say BS because I think the powers that be monitored your language and oh really they did yeah uh, right. so um my client was subject to a nonsensical pfa and because it was being litigated in the COVID era in quarantine and i'm sitting in court and i'm seeing these judges just issue pfa final order after pfa final order there was a risk of litigating this and in, in asserting a defense so even though it was nonsensical, I negotiated with the other side. And in that negotiation, it was essentially that he agreed to stay away from the complainant. Um, and it was going to expire in a certain amount of time and he would get it expunged. It, was, it wasn't going to hurt him. But the triggering offense here for my client... I see what you did there. <laughs> was the initial filing of that PFA, which had attached to it a firearms relinquishment order. And so even before my client got into court, which is the due process issues we were talking about in the PFA nowadays episode, even before he got into court, his firearms were taken away from him. And once his PFA was expunged, oh, let, no, let me back up. In the negotiations for the final order that would ultimately go away and ultimately be expunged, we agreed that the court would order that his hunting weapons would be returned to him immediately. So once that order is entered, he's seeking his hunting weapons back from the state police or from the local police department. And what they have to do is a Pennsylvania state police check to make sure they can return the firearms. And they deny their return. The state police do. The state police deny their and return. And that's who you're up against in this litigation, That's right? who I'm up against. And initially, they deny the return for, a, like, I don't know, I think about 10 reasons. Yeah, I and saw they, that in your brief. Well, like, what were the reasons? Oh, my God. It, they, it was, it, I'm not going to actually go into the reasons right. because I don't want to. Okay. I don't want to taint our listeners right. here. But they, they were they, reasons that shouldn't have been upheld. And they were reasons. Were they were, subjective reasons or were they like miscalculations? Miscalculations. Of, all right, all right. And they would cite for each reason two different laws. One was federal law under Title 18 of the United States Code 922 G1. And one was our state law under Title 18 of the Pennsylvania um, Code. It was 6105, I believe. And I would respond to the Pennsylvania State Police with letters and say why they were wrong on each of these. And there was a few letters going back and forth between me and the Pennsylvania State Police. And ultimately, it whittled down to one issue. So it started with a bunch, and they're like, ah, she's right. And then there was one issue they wouldn't get off. And that was under Title 18 of the United States Code 922 G1, my client's old second offense DUI, it was from the early 2000s, was a prohibiting offense barring the return of his firearms. Basically a state court misdemeanor with a greater penalty, two years or greater, right? Yes. Okay. So 920, I don't have it in front of me, so I'll, yeah. I'll generally tell you. 922 G1 says any person who's been convicted of a crime punishable uh, by more than one year imprisonment, cannot possess a firearm that's touched interstate commerce. And there's exceptions to that because there's definitions on, under 921 of Title 18 of the United States Code and under the d definitions of a, of a crime punishable by more than one year, it does not include state misdemeanors that are punishable by two years or less. Is it less than two years? Oh, whatever. It's either less than two years. It's got to be more than two years okay. of a state misdemeanor right. for it to qualify under 922 G1. So what that means is in Pennsylvania, if you're convicted of a misdemeanor of the first degree, 
which we learned in the previous episode and maybe some other episodes, carries with it a maximum offense of five years imprisonment. That would be a disqualifying offense on its face for purposes of 922G, one to apply to strip somebody of their Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Um, what's interesting about DUI law, Pete, is that a second offense highest tier DUI was not a misdemeanor of the first degree. Until five years before your brief. Five I read years, your brief. Five years before my brief. Clearly you didn't. It was not no. five years before my Oh, brief. was it five years before what? It was five years. I saw it was five, five years. years be- it was four years before his conviction. Yeah, if he had been convicted was five a, years. Learn how to take a compliment. Oh, okay. I thought that was a very effective argument because, you know, this new, uh, I'll say it. I think it's asinine standard. Um in Bruin. Um, am I allowed to say asinine? I think I said it in the last episode. Okay. Um, this historical analog um, component. Um, remember when I was talking, the chicken little sky is falling and they were talking about originalism? Well, here it is. And that's why I made the comment early on. You know, you have to find a historical analog. Half of the crimes that we have now couldn't even have been contemplated historically, because the things that people can use to commit crimes didn't exist. Um, but I digress. Um, but the, the uh, oh, I lost my train of thought now. What was I saying? Do you, were you, even you were complimenting to me? my brief, so I'm listening intently. Oh, yeah. So we were talking about, um, you know, the, the, the government must affirmatively prove that its firearms regulation is part of the historical tradition that delimits the other bounds of the right to keep and bear arms. And they talk about analogs to um, prior offenses. What you did, which was very effective, was to say, basically, you don't have to go into the, the uh, 18th century. Just look five years ago. This wasn't a disqualifying offense. I thought that was very effective. Thank you, Pete. Uh, that's the last compliment you'll receive for at least five episodes. Then I'm going to sit in that for five seconds. Go. <laughs> um, so once once we we already talked to you about 922 G1, 920, and that's the prohibiting persons um, from people who cannot possess firearms. And I argued it a couple of ways back in the day because when I filed this appeal, it was 2020, and Bruin wasn't born yet. Oh wow! Bruin was born. You were prescient. Well, you know what it was. I'm looking at 922 G1, and it's uh, someone who's prohibited from possessing a firearm that affects interstate commerce. It was the Commerce Clause, and I was like, these are family heirlooms. This is nonsense. He's had these firearms since he was. A young person. He's got children he wants to pass them down to. Hunting's big in my client's family. They're responsible people. They're really good people. This is his property. So this commerce clause element to 922 G1 was where I was hooked. Then Bruin, and we we didn't get listed for a hearing because the, the um, let me put this a good way, the communication between the administrative court and my office, it was tough. Mm. And ultimately, when we got listed for a hearing, Bruin had come down the pipeline. And not only Bruin, but Range, which was, which is a Third Circuit case. Now, just as a refresher to everybody, where, oh, there it is. Range versus Attorney General of the United States of America. It's a Third Circuit case that came out in 2023. And by the time we were litigating this in an administrative court, it was after Range was born as well. You may remember there's, in terms of hierarchy of courts, there's the Supreme Court of the United States, which is the controlling court of our country. The Supreme Court's law controls all law below it. It controls the circuit courts federally, and it controls the state courts. Federally, below the Supreme Court are circuit courts. So we in Pennsylvania are in the Third Circuit. Delaware's in the Third Circuit. New Jersey's in the Third Circuit. Pennsylvania's in the Third Circuit. Puerto Rico's in the Third Circuit. But Third Circuit law is not controlling law for state courts. It's persuasive authority. It doesn't dictate to state courts what they have to do. And where this was really interesting in the conundrum my client and I are are dealing with is we're in an administrative state court interpreting federal law 
that is control that has controlling law under Bruin and persuasive law under range. So it is complicated, and that's why we're in the middle of briefing right now. But in range, what the court did was break down Bruin into three pieces, which is what I named as the Bruin test. The range court said, step one, we have to determine if the person is seeking their firearms is one of the people protected by the Second Amendment. Step two, the proposed conduct regulated by 922 G1 is protected by the Second Amendment. And step three, there's no precedent in history which supports depriving a person convicted of a DUI of the right to keep and bear arms. Now, Range didn't say DUI. I said DUI. In Range, they were talking about forgery, which is a separate misdemeanor of the first degree in Pennsylvania with a statutory maximum of five years. And the Range Court said that misdemeanor of the first degree didn't pass the Bruin test. And so I use that as the analogy and as persuasive authority as to why my client should be able to have his property returned to him and his Second Amendment right remains undisturbed by this this DUI conviction from the early 2000s. And really, the court did does not have to look any further than when the DUI changed. Did you like the gerrymandering? Mm-hmm. When I said this is just a product of legislative semantics and gerrymandering? No, my favorite part was when you were talking about how our country is basically founded on guns. <laughs> That's what I read. You're, you were quoting from some book that said that well, the reason that we fought England was that they were trying to take our guns. Is that what you said? I was quoting from another Third Circuit case. Yeah. Um, it, it, I wasn't ready for you to say that. <laughs> I know you weren't. I mean, I, I also read, and I know you've read, there's an article in PACDL's um, publication where Caroline and I are both uh, ardent. Pennsylvania Association of Criminal Defense Lawyer, PACDL members. And this Pete's was a past from, president. Um, and hopefully he'll be a future president at some point. But um, they had this article that was written by two gun lawyers. Did you read it? I, I'm sure I did. Yeah. The one guy has the gun law firm and appears on Newsmax frequently. Um, and they are making an argument, which has apparently been successful in certain respects, that, for instance... If you are a heroin dealer or a cocaine dealer, that because in the 1800s, um, Bayer marketed heroin to the masses legally in 1898 as a cough suppressant. Further, cocaine was used and marketed as a tonic for all sorts of maladies. Okay, you can't take the guns anymore because there's no historical analog to dealing heroin or dealing cocaine. It's asinine. Now, listen, I'm not saying that um, just because you have a a past felony conviction for marijuana that it should be an outright bar. But on the other hand, if you're dealing heroin and dealing cocaine, do we think that you should have a gun? Do we have to go into the 1800s? It's going to lead to absurd results. I think the way the law is written, though, is problematic. What was the, do you know off the top of your head, the old standard had to do with... Uh, Heller it, and McDonald? Yeah. It was a it was a mean scrutiny test. Right. So it was a historical analog. They did have the historical mm-hmm. analog, but also a mean scrutiny test. And that's where Justice Thomas said, well, the mean scrutiny test is one step too many. Who woke him up? Uh, probably the Republican Party. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Um, but, no, but I, I use that I use that argument for the interstate commerce, and it go, it kind of goes back to you know I don't mean to keep harping back on other episodes we've done, but I do like to loop so everybody feels connected. She's really big into looping. Well, I just want us to feel connected, and, and you know we've experienced this before. It's you look at something, you're like, well, why is that fair? Mm-hmm. You know, my client gets convicted of a second offense, high seer DUI in the early 2000s, and nobody could be bothered to go knocking on his door and taking his firearms. But now because he gets served with a nonsensical PFA, he can't have them back and they're his family heirlooms and it's just nonsense so even before Bruin it's not just a historical analog as to is he somebody who should be regulated is it was a commerce clause argument but now this commerce clause argument with Bruin attached to it is there's no historical analog saying that just because a gun was once manufactured in a different state a hundred years ago that one at one time remotely 
touched interstate commerce that that implicates 922 G1. That's nuts. I still think that. Was it a crime in the 1700s to ride a horse drunk? No. Oh. No. And the first regulations, well, the first regulations for firearms was, I believe, 1938. And it was reserved for very serious crimes like murder and kidnapping and robbery. And DUI laws, you saw in the brief, was enacted in 1909. So if, if in, in 1938, by the way, is not founding era history. I guess my problem, and I'm being What's your sarcastic. I, it, I want to move forward. I, I mean, I, I understand. I'm not a, I guess a, at my base, I am not a um, strict constructionist, uh, originalist um, type of person. Our country has changed. Our country has evolved. Technology has evolved. There has to be a better way. I agree with you. Just because you have a DUI from 20 years ago should not be an outright bar to owning a firearm. On the other hand, I don't think we need to look into the 1700s to determine whether somebody should possess a firearm. This is where lawyers aren't practical. Well, I think, I don't know that that's totally fair because lawyers aren't the ones creating the law. We're arguing its application. Lawyers are interpreting laws, though. Arguing its application. Mm. Or I think courts are interpreting laws after the lawyers make the advocacy for their client. Yeah, but courts are lawyers. Courts themselves are lawyers, but it's not <laughs> all lawyers, Pete. And ultimately, when you have a circumstance where the law went too far, I mean, it's any it's any extreme, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the historical analog, that's an extreme. It's probably not going to hold up forever. But what happened to my client is the other extreme. Well, I'm not disagreeing with you, but do you agree with me that it's kind of asinine that we have to look into the 1700s to see if there's a historical analog to a crime today that would be a predicate, um, you know, um, disqualifying offense? I think if that's the law right now, I'm going to use the controlling law You're to dodging. serve my client's interests. I didn't ask you about serving your client's interests. My I opinion asked doesn't you, matter. I'm not sitting on a court. I want to know your opinion. I want to know whether it, it makes sense to you as a human being, not a lawyer, because we're both, but not all lawyers are human beings. The, do we really need to look into the 1700s as a test for whether somebody should possess a firearm? I honestly don't know how to answer that only because I see the extreme on the other side and I don't think it's fair for the government to reach out and overreach into a client's property interests, into their constitutional interests. And that's what happened to my client. So whatever is out there to fix that harm to my client, I'm going to use it. Now, we've established, hopefully in other episodes, that I was not a very good law student, but I do remember in classes, and I see it today, that there are certain, if it infringes upon, if a, a law or regulation infringes upon uh, a right, then there's like a strict scrutiny test, right? There's like strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, right? Like that stuff. Mm -hmm. Just have a strict scrutiny test. Is this regulation as applied to this individual? Is it, is it, um, does it meet that standard? I, I don't know. I, it, it, we, I've belabored the point. I just think it's it's a ridiculous test. It was. It's a means and scrutiny test that the pri previous cases held. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I just. I think any extreme is bad, and I think mm -hmm. if there is a complete bar to someone like my client, that an injustice to one is an injustice to all. And well, and I think it's to your credit, you know, that you can advocate so strongly. And we both do this. Sometimes we advocate so strongly, even though our politics or something else might not necessarily um, align with either the clients or the cause. Um, my point is that in terms of, of deciding who should and shouldn't have firearms, that there has to be a better way than looking 300 years. Is that 300 years ago? That's many, many years. Yeah. But yeah. here's my other gripe with it. A lot of the cases that are brought before these courts to be scrutinized are people who are seeking firearms or seeking a, a license. My client wasn't seeking anything. He just wanted his stuff back. He just wanted his, the government took his stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm all for, you know, I like fighting the man. Um, and I, you know, government overreach. Absolutely.
I'm just talking in a broader sense about how we decide. You're trying to who figure out. You're trying to figure out how we create the best society for all, where people are well, safe. Safe society. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, reading. I'm again, not mocking you for that. Harkening back to that, ep- you know, the gun law guy, the gun law firm. That's a very niche practice, but apparently gets you on Newsmax. Um, What's Newsmax? You, you wouldn't know, and then you don't need to know. Um, but the the point is that they're they're ready to argue. <laughs> in this, I can't believe you didn't see this. They're saying that because heroin and cocaine were, weren't illegal, then they were prescribed back in the 1800s that, well, that obviously you can still possess a firearm. And they're not even willing to concede that because you've been convicted of murder that you shouldn't possess a firearm. Well, if they want to come on this podcast, I have a lot of questions. Yeah. I, I think that's interesting. No, no thank you. I know. I don't want to end on that note. What? Common sense. Lawyers don't have common sense. Think- That's a whole other episode. <laughs> okay. I think I think um, that put the topic out there for the public to chew on. Yeah. And if you guys have questions about that, uh, my client gives me permission to let you know how it shakes out. I'll let you know. But I can promise you this. No matter who wins at this level, this case is getting appealed. So we're in it for the long haul. Just like this podcast session. (laughs) All right. That's it for this episode of Subject to Cross. Signing off. Don't you need to say Subject to Cross? That's why you're the host. No, I'm not. You go. Email us at subjecttocross at com. Thank you. Signing off. Mm